Chicago with forty dollars in my pocket. My son is now twelve. I'm still married, and I love my wife dearly. We had to make a living. I was younger than I am now, and thought I needed more. I didn't believe in prohibiting people from getting the things they wanted. I thought prohibition was an unjust law, and I still do. What if I told you that a glass of alcohol during the 1920s could be more dangerous than we ever imagined? Because it wasn't just bootleggers or the mob who posed a threat, but the U.S. government itself. In an effort to enforce prohibition, the U.S. government took a drastic and deadly measure. It poisoned alcohol to deter people from drinking. And the result? Thousands of deaths, public outrage, and a lasting stain on American history. Now, let's dive into the era that made this all possible. Prohibition. 61 15-gallon barrels and 183 8-gallon barrels of rye whiskey, estimated to be the largest individual seizure of liquor in the state of New Jersey. The year is 1920. The 18th Amendment has just passed, and the U.S. is officially a dry nation. Lawmakers believed banning alcohol would reduce crime, boost public health, and help people live morally upright lives. But what they didn't anticipate was a massive backlash in how determined people would be to keep drinking. Instead of cleaning up the country, Prohibition opened the door to a world of secret bars bootleggers and organized crime syndicates. One of the biggest problems? The law didn't change people's desire to drink. In fact, it may have made alcohol more alluring. In the commercial area of Georgetown, it was a real good front. The basement went right out through the back and out to the alleyway. Now, Dad would mix his alcohol there and I ciphered a many a quart jar full of alcohol. Enter the speakeasy. Underground bars where people could drink, socialize, and defy the law. From the outside, they looked like nothing more than a plain storefront. But behind a hidden door, or in a secret basement, the party was alive and well. These spots became a social hotspot, often filled with jazz music, dancing, and bootleg liquor. And you had to know the right people or the secret password to get in. Now imagine a place where everyone's having a good time and suddenly someone falls ill, poisoned by the very drink in their hand. But how did things get to this point? Industrial alcohol used in things like fuel and cologne quickly becomes the go-to solution during prohibition for those looking to drink. But because of the poisonous additives meant to deter consumption, bootleggers are forced to filter the dangerous additives out. Gangs took over the industry, and none became more infamous than Chicago's very own Al Capone. His empire stretched from smuggling alcohol across the Canadian border to controlling distilleries in the Midwest. Capone made millions, all while the U.S. government struggled to enforce the Volstead Act, which defined what counted as illegal alcohol and set penalties for breaking the law. And by the mid-1920s, it was clear. Prohibition wasn't working. By 1931, Al Capone was at the top of his game. He had no real rivals anymore among Chicago's mobsters, and he continued to expand his empire in case prohibition was repealed. The more the government tried to crack down the illegal alcohol, the more people found ways to get around it. Bootleggers, organized crime, and bribed law enforcement officials made sure alcohol continued to flow through America's veins. The government needed a new plan, one that would target the source of illegal booze directly. He brought the hearse up into the back alley. They put everything in the hearse, and where did they go? The safest place there could be, the Arlington Cemetery. Who's going to stop them? There's a hearse going into Arlington Cemetery. Are they going to stop a soldier from being buried? No way. Faced with the unstoppable tide of bootleg alcohol, the U.S. government, particularly the Treasury Department, made a radical decision. So in response, the government began a process called denaturing. This involved adding toxic chemicals to industrial alcohol, essentially turning it into poison. The goal was simple, 
make it undrinkable. But this wasn't just a bitter tasting trick to ward off consumers. The chemicals added were lethal. The federal government's response to this is unbelievable. What they do is they double the amount of poison in denatured alcohol. They double the amount of poison. They double the amount of poison, hoping that that would stop people from drinking it. Quinine, used in malaria treatment, was added to give the alcohol a revolting taste. But when ingested in large quantities, it could cause severe health issues. And there was methyl alcohol, also known as wood alcohol, which is far more dangerous. Even small amounts can cause blindness or death. I'd suck into it and I'd get a mouthful, he'd say, swallow it. Oh, man, that was like swallowing fire water. <laughs> what it was. As you can imagine, this didn't go as planned. The people buying illegal alcohol didn't know it had been poisoned. Bootleggers were more concerned about profit than public safety, and many simply didn't care or didn't realize how toxic the alcohol had become. People would unknowingly drink this tainted alcohol at speakeasies or in the privacy of their homes, and the consequences were devastating. The U.S. government refused to take any responsibility for the poisonings and rather laid blame on the drinkers. And bootleggers kept quiet in order to keep business afloat. In cities like New York, the death toll was alarming. By 1927, more than 400 people in New York City alone had died from consuming poisoned alcohol. Nationwide, estimates suggest that by the time Prohibition ended, thousands of Americans had fallen victim to the government's poisoning campaign. Dr. Charles Norris, the chief medical examiner of New York City, was one of the first to publicly decry this program. He saw firsthand the human cost. His job was to determine the cause of death for many victims and he was outraged at what he found. How many people do you think prohibition alcohol poisoned? We'll never know for certain. It could be, you know, tens of thousands up to 100,000. Norris, along with his deputy, Alexander Gettler, who would later be hailed as one of the pioneers of forensic science, documented the horrifying effects of the poisoned alcohol in meticulous detail. Norris and Gettler didn't mince words. They accused the government of legalized murder. Imagine that, a top city official telling the public that the very people sworn to protect them were in fact responsible for their deaths. This wasn't just an accident. It was a deliberate policy. Chicago's mayor at this time was Big Bill Thompson, a greedy politician who was less interested in curbing the gangsters than in holding office. As Norris's findings became public, newspapers across the country picked up the story. People were horrified. Families who had lost loved ones due to the poison alcohol spoke out, and soon protests began to mount. The press played a huge role in spreading the outrage. The Chicago Tribune went as far as to say the government's actions amounted to nothing less than murder. But despite the outcry, the poisoning continued for several years. The government believed that the ends justified the means that the deaths caused by poison alcohol were necessary to scare people away from drinking. It was a brutal form of deterrence, one that had severe and often fatal consequences. While Big Bill was mayor, a gangster named Al Capone ruled as undisputed boss of the Chicago underworld. By the early 1930s, it became clear that prohibition had failed. The black market for alcohol was too profitable organized crime too powerful, and public resentment too high. In 1933, the 21st Amendment was passed, repealing the 18th Amendment and ending prohibition. We therefore recommend that the Congress of the United States immediately propose an amendment to the federal constitution repealing the 18th Amendment. Thousands of Americans lost their lives, not because they broke the law, but because the law itself was dangerous. Today, this chapter serves as a stark reminder of the unintended consequences of policy decisions and how far governments might go to enforce laws, even at the cost of human life. The story of prohibition and the government's poisoning program offers powerful lessons for today.
and raises difficult questions about the role of government in regulating personal behavior and the ethical limits of law enforcement. Should the government ever sacrifice lives to enforce a law? And how far is too far when it comes to determining illegal behavior? Even now, we can see parallels in current debates over drug policy, the war on drugs, and mass incarceration. Just like during Prohibition, well-intended policies can sometimes lead to tragic and unintended consequences. So what's your take on this? Could such drastic measures ever be justified? Do you think the government learned from its mistakes, or are we still repeating the same errors today? Drop your thoughts in the comments. And before you go, if you enjoyed this deep dive, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. We've got plenty more fascinating stories like this video on how social media companies are acting as agents of the U.S. government to suppress citizen speech in what we call Social Media Mockingbird.